and sat down and talked to people. You buy that? No. Nobody does. Also, my printer would not work at home, nor would the printer here work. So um, I have to preach off of the laptop today where my sermon is. So hopefully that won't be too much of a distraction for you. Let me go get my Bible. Don't move. All right. So if you want to open up your Bibles to Psalm 119, that would be great. Um, we are almost finished with this psalm, uh, and, and, and the reason that we're going through it is because I want to encourage you and empower you uh, to read your Bibles this year. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to open up God's Word and show the benefit that comes from faithful Bible reading. Uh, what God can work in our lives when we uh, devote ourselves to God's Word. And, um, and that's what this sermon series has been about. So this sermon and one other one, and we'll be finished with it. Um, but this, one, this sermon is entitled Shameless Bible Reading Part 2. How many people remember Shameless Bible Reading Part 1? Like two people, yeah. I barely remembered it too. It's a sign of good preaching when people can remember the sermon. <sighs> no one can remember it. But, um, yeah, this is the second part to that. And so before I say anything else, let's go to God in prayer and ask for help, and then we'll just dive right in. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the time to gather here today. Uh, we're thankful for the promise that where two or three are gathered, you are among us. We know your spirit lives inside of us and that Christ reigns in our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I pray that you would do that this morning. As we open your word, that you would make this a safe place, that you would banish the enemy. We know that he is active when the word is read, when the word is spoken, when the word is preached. He devours it up. He wants it to be fruitless in our lives. And so we pray for your protection. We pray that this that we would receive this word with soft hearts because this word is able to save our souls. Uh, we pray that you would do a mighty work among us. We love you. Give us great joy that comes through your word, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. So what we learned when we talked about shameless Bible reading part one is, is twofold. The first thing we learned is um, that God promises joy through his word. God promises that his word brings about joy. And we see it in verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 119. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. All right, so God promises joy to us through his word. The word of God brings about joy as we give ourselves to it and our faith meets the word, all right? We meet his words with faith. Another thing we learn is that when we neglect God's word, we do something very dangerous. We exchange joy for shame. And we see that in verses five through six. Um, and I'll read this ESV version in the, and then the NET translation, which is an excellent. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having fixed my eyes on all your commandments. This is the NET version. It's uh, Daniel Wallace's translation. It's really good. If only I were predisposed to keep your statutes, then I would not be put to shame if I were focused on all your commandments. So when the word of God leaves us, when we don't give ourselves to the word of God, we take the joy that God promises to bring about through his word and we exchange it for shame. That's the meaning of verses 5 and 6. An absence of God's word is a presence of shame. And so there's two ways that God deals with the shame we experience when we open our Bibles to read. Because when you open, your, open the word of God, you're confronted with the reality that God is a holy and just God and that we are sinful people. It's impossible to read God's word and come away feeling really good about yourself. It's a constant reminder that he is holy. He has a standard that we, we can't meet. So there's two ways that God deals with the shame that causes. First, 
He clothes us in Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the blessed man in every one of these psalms. He is, in his flesh, the man who loves the law of the Lord and who walks in the ways of God. That, that person is Jesus Christ. And so we, by faith, receive Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. Our sin is imputed to Jesus Christ. And we stand justified before God because of Christ's perfect and righteous life. And so we don't feel shame when we stand before God because we are clothed in the person of Jesus Christ. When God looks at us in Christ, he sees Christ's finished work, Christ's perfect righteousness. And so we rest in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the primary way that God deals with shame. But there's another way that God deals with shame that we didn't talk about when we preached on this, when I preached on the sermon two weeks ago. And that is, he deals with our shame by redirecting our vision. And you see it in verse 6, right? Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. That's the ESV. Here's the NET. Then I would not be put to shame if I were focused on all your commandments. And so, so the vision changes. One of the ways that God deals with our shame is he takes our gaze and puts it on his word. And so what I want to look at today is practically how giving ourselves to God's word removes shame, how it actually works. Christianity is a supernatural religion, and there are things that God works in our lives that we can't explain. But there are also things that God works in our lives that we can look at and feel in touch because God uses means. So one of the ways that God deals with our shame is he redirects our vision from worthless things to his word. But why look at God's word? I mean, why, why give yourself to God's word? And one of the answers to that question, and the only one I'm going to really bring up, is God's word works. That's why. It's not an empty word. It's not a dead word. That's why when you give yourself to God's word, it causes things to happen in your life. And so we see it in Psalm 119. Just turn over to verse 104, right? Psalm 119, 104. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. See how the word of God works there? Understanding God's word changes a person's affections. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate something. Before we come to Christ, we love false ways. We thrive on false ways. But when you come to Christ and you give yourself to God's word and he begins to unfold to you the way the world works through his word, that word changes what you love. The more I stay in your word, the more I hate sin. That's it, the word works. Verse 107. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. God's word gives life. So God's word is not an empty word. It's a word that commands and creates. Like Genesis 1 verse 3, God said, let there be light. What is that? That's a command. And there was light. What is that? A creation or a response. That's what God's word it, does It commands realities, and then it brings about the very reality that it commands. It's, that's what it means for God's word to be living. And the same happens in the new birth. Why are you a Christian? Really, why are you a Christian? We could go around the room, and every one of you would give a different response. I walked an aisle, I signed a card, I prayed a prayer, I got baptized, I got born again. Well, look at what it says in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. I, I'll just read it to you. But it's 1 Peter 1, verse 3 and verse 23 if you're wanting to take notes of the scripture and, and, and go back and look, look at them later. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God causes us to be born again. If you're born again, the primary reason you're born again is because God caused it to happen. The way he caused it to happen is revealed in verse 23. You've been born again, 
not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. God causes the new birth through his word. It demands new birth and it creates new birth. That's what it means for God's word to be living. So God's word creates reality and new hearts and new minds and a new birth and new affections and everything. That, that's what God's word does. So when you give yourself to God's word, you're giving yourself to a power that raises the dead. It's not an empty thing here. It works. The question is, how does it work? How does God's word work as you give yourself to it? Well, as we gaze at God's word, our affections and our person become what we behold. And that's like the point of 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of that glory from one degree of glory to the next. In other words, as you behold the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, when you read the Bible, as you gaze at that word and you fix your eyes and mind on it, you become the very thing that you behold from one degree to the next. And so... Sometimes the change is minimal and it's small and you can almost, it's almost undiscernible. But sometimes it's larger. It just depends. So beholding the grace of God in the face of Jesus Christ, right, leads to living in a power. As we look, as we gaze, we're changed. But what does it mean to look? That's, that is the, that's one of the main questions. What I'm saying is God's word is living and powerful. That's why we give ourselves to it. And the way it works in our life is as we gaze on God's word and specifically the person of God revealed in Jesus Christ, the embodiment of the word, the word became flesh, we become what we behold. But what does it mean to look? Because a lot of people look at this word and they don't ever become anything. They don't ever change. Plenty of scholars out there that are atheists, biblical scholars that are atheists, don't believe. And they've looked at this word more than most of us have. So there's a looking that's a looking, and there's a looking that's a not looking. And so you have to ask, okay, what does it mean to look? If I want God's word to change me, I have to look at it in a way where the gazing brings about the change. And for that, James chapter 1 is, is just a perfect example. And James 1 verses 22 through 25 gives us an example of what it means to look and what it means to look and not look. All right, James 1 verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. This, these two verses define what it means to look but not look. Looking at God's word in a way that's really not looking is like looking in a mirror at your reflection and walking away from it and forgetting what you look like. So he gives us a word picture to illustrate what it means to not look at the word of God when you're looking at it. So let's, how many of you remember what your reflection looked like when you last left your house? The well, last time you looked in your, how many of you, not even, not, not, I mean, just have a vague remembrance of, okay, this is kind of what it looked like when I looked in the mirror before I left. Isn't? I mean, most people kind of know, right? What it, and so when I'm trying to figure out what James means, I have to kind of go through what he doesn't mean. Most people understand what they look like the last time they looked at themselves in a mirror. So it's not necessarily that. But how many of you really thought twice about your reflection, since you looked at your reflection? Have you spent time obsessing over the reflection that you looked, over your reflection, the last time you looked at your reflection when you left the house? How many of you have obsessed over that? 
and thought about it. It went over it, over and over and over again in your mind. And look at how, and remember how that hair was out of place and how you had a gray hair right here or how you had a wrinkle right around your eyes and you need to buy something to, to, to fill that up. I mean, how many of you have obsessed over what your reflection looked like? Nobody. You look at your reflection and you say, okay, it's all right. It's been better. It's also been worse. I'm good to go. And you go and you do what? You forget about it. That's the way most people look at God's word. Oh, that's okay. okay boom, boom. I'm going to read it, read it, read it. And they live their life as if they never come in contact with it. What James is teaching us here is looking at God's word is the opposite of looking in the mirror and then going to work. It's a looking that penetrates a person. It's the looking that sticks around with a person. It's the looking that goes from gazing at a mirror to looking inside your heart or your or yourself. So, so back to James 1, 22 through 25. I'll close my Bible like a rookie. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, keeps looking. Be no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. So that's the looking that we're talking about. It's the same as saying, um, let's see Psalm 119. I have stored up your word in my heart. This is verse 11. That I may not sin against you. The looking that's really a looking is a looking that stores God's word up and recalls it as we go throughout the day. It's a constant bringing up of the word that we've meditated on, the word that we've read, the word that we've prayed over. That's what it means to look at the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Beholding the grace of God in the face of Jesus Christ leads to living in a power. That's what God's word does when you give yourself to it and it gets inside of you. You live in a power. So if you go like to Romans 5 in verse 2, it says, um, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Grace, God's grace, is not something merely that covers your sin. It's a, it's a power in which you stand. In which you stand. It's a, it has a rule. It has a reign. So you, when you go to Romans 6, verse 12, it says, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God. As those who've been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. It's a power. Sin doesn't have dominion anymore. Why? For or since you're not under law, but under grace. You see that? Law and sin were a reign. In our life. It's a, it was a power in our life. It reigned and it ruled. But now, you're under a different power. Namely, grace. And instead of sin reigning in our mortal bodies, grace does. Righteousness does. Sin's not just something that God gave you so you could keep doing what you wanted to do and be forgiven. Grace is a power that God gives us to change us. Grace is not a power that excuses our sin. It's a power that defeats our sin. Grace isn't a power that excuses what we love so we can keep on doing the things that we love that are bad and be forgiven of it. Grace is a power that changes what we love. Grace is a power. So how does grace change us practically? Because as you go to God's word and you look at it and you see the person of God 
in the face of Jesus Christ. The embodiment of the word became flesh. God's spoken word in a person. And you look at this person and how he lives and acts and loves. And you meditate on it and it gets inside of you and it changes you. The question is, well, how does it change you? Is it like a genie or a fairy? Sprinkle the Holy Spirit dust on you. Or, or, does God work in us supernaturally in a way that's very natural? That, that's, that's the question. How does grace change us practically? And this is something that's very personal to me. It's personal for me because all of this you can get from Psalm 119 of how God's word, word works to change us. But until you experience it and you're like, oh, okay. It doesn't land right. So, how does grace change us practically? And there's four realities and we're, and we're done. And they all end with shuns. So you can remember them. Grace, God's grace, as we give ourselves to his word and we receive it by faith, changes us practically through, number one, affliction. Affliction. So I get this from Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. So what precedes the, the uh, psalmist obedience is what? Affliction. That's why it's number one on the list. It says the same thing in 71. It's good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. So when God changes who you are as a person, the first thing you will experience is affliction, and most of it which is caused by your own stupidity and your own sin. You get thrown headfirst into sin, you hurt people, you make a bunch of stupid mistakes, you deal with the guilt, you deal with the sorrow, you deal with the hurt, and you're left reeling, feeling that God doesn't love you, that you're probably not even a Christian. How can, even, how can a Christian do these kind of things to people? That you're a hypocrite, that you're fake, that you're false. All sorts of affliction happens. That's what happens when we sin. And... This is a very, very difficult time because the last thing that people want when they're afflicted is what? God's Word. I want to go to God's Word when I'm feeling like, a, like I'm not a Christian. It'll just confirm what I think already. So affliction is the first thing that happens. And it happens in, in various forms. And it may not be because of sin. It may be something you're going through. It may or may not be affliction. But whatever it is, whatever it is, God is, is using it. The first thing that happens is we are afflicted. Without affliction, we don't understand God's word as we ought to understand it. So when you pray for understanding over a passage, get ready. Because most of the time, God grants that understanding in ways that you would never expect. You read a passage, you put it in your head, you live life, you make a bunch of stupid mistakes, and you say, oh, that's what that verse meant. You know, and it would be nice if we could just read it and say, okay, well, God, give me understanding right now. You know, and we can, well, I've diagrammed this and I've done a discourse analysis on it, and this is what it says. Sometimes it comes that way, most of the time it comes through affliction. Grace changes us practically, number one, through affliction. But number two, after the affliction comes education. So when you're going through affliction for something that you've done or something that you haven't done, when you're in the flame, in the, in the crucible of the flame that God's using to mold you, right behind the affliction comes the education. And here's where I, why I say this, verse 71. It's good for me that I was afflicted. Why? That I might learn your statutes. Okay. Same thing is said in verse 11, right, of Psalm 119. I have stored up your word in my heart. That's what it means to be educated 
by God's word. You go from being afflicted because you weren't mindful of God's word. And that affliction leads you to an education of what God's word actually means. And a deeper revealing of God's ways. And so people that have battled various addictions, if you've ever battled an addiction, you'll see a transformation when you begin to be set free from it. Before, what you really were addicted to is what you loved. And you were obsessed with the positive things that it gave you. But once affliction comes and beats up against the thing that you're addicted to, you begin to see the thing that you once struggled with from a lot of different angles. You begin to see how it affected you negatively, how it affected other people negatively. You begin to look at all the hurt and pain that it caused you. You become educated on how God's word speaks to that. And as you become enlightened to the reason that God gives his commands, that education happens. What follows next, the third point, is transformation. So it's affliction. Education, transformation. Transformation happens more often than not when we understand that God's not trying to be a joy kill when he tells me not to do something. I can't do anything. I hear people say this. I don't want to become a Christian because I can't do anything when I become a Christian. All this fun stuff that I could do before, I can't do once I become a Christian. A lot of people think God is a joy kill until you go through hell and you begin to understand why you went through that hell. And you say, oh, what I once looked at as life is actually death. And now I'm beginning to understand that this is what death feels like. And the opposite of death is life. And the psalmist says, give me life according to your word. Transformation begins to happen on a very basic level. You begin to pinpoint on a broad spectrum, the things that cause you pain and hurt, the things that attack and rob your joy, and you say, oh, that's bad. This is bad. God's word has always said it was bad, but now I know why it's bad. My affliction taught me, I'm going to give my life now intentionally to what God's word says because I'm tired of feeling this way. I'm tired of hurting the people around me. I'm tired of walking in death. I want life now. And when you give yourself to God's word, transformation happens. Like Psalm 119, 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Do you see how that works? When you give yourself to God's word and you look at it and you put it somewhere and you meditate on it, that word fights the inclination to sin. And so what God does is he changes you. He gives you big concepts, right? Like addictions are usually broad concepts. Drugs, sex, alcohol, whatever it is. He gives you knowledge that addiction to this is bad. But he begins to change you from a very... I call it, uh, the word I'm looking for is a, he, he, he changes us from the, from the level of inclination. So in other words, what you'll see as you grow in God's word and you, under, and you go through the affliction and the education and the transformation is that what, what God uses his word to do through the power of the spirit is to shape how we respond to things naturally. So what you'll begin to understand is if you have a, um, a porn problem, that porn's not really your problem. The problem is how much you love what's displayed on the screen. You'll see the problem as, I love that. So he takes it from the realm of, I have a porn problem, to I have a heart problem. I have a heart that's given to 
love these acts. No matter where they are, I love them. I love them. That's what I want. It's what drives me. It's an inclination. It's an impulse. So if you were to walk into a room not wanting to view porn, if you have a porn problem, I can almost guarantee you if you're by yourself, you'll look and stay looked. Whereas some people would go, oh, what's that? It's an inclination issue. And so if you're struggling with something like that, what God has to do to change it is he has to change it from a response issue to where when you're dealing with that, the initial response has to be not, I can't, but rather kind of like, I, I don't. Not, I can't look at this. I don't look at this. God's word gives me life. His word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. I know what it's like to be afflicted. I know what this causes. I don't do I don't look at it. I don't look at it. And it progresses. So somebody might walk in and sit on the screen, and it might take them a minute to say, whoa, 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 I don't do this. But what God is doing is he's taking you, He's shaping those initial responses and those initial impulses. So like Matthew 12, 36 and 37, Jesus says, I tell you that man will give an account for every idle word he speaks on the day of judgment. For by your words will you be justified and by your words will you be condemned. Now does that mean that Jesus has a cosmic tape recorder and we're going to stand before him on the day of judgment and he's going to put that tape recorder on the stand and press play. And says, these are all your idle words. And if they're good idle words, you'll be justified. And if they're bad idle words, you'll be condemned. No. What Jesus means is this. Idle words are natural impulse responses. They're what we say when something goes wrong. Well, you don't think about it. It's the way you feel when something happens. It's the way you naturally process things. And so what this means is that God is in the business of changing you, not to where you simply can just walk out of the room and no longer look at porn. He's in the business of changing you to where you begin to hate naturally what you used to love naturally. And the impulse changes. That's the goal. And when that kind of transformation happens, wow, then you see major breakthrough. The issue with this kind of transformation is it's from one degree of glory to the next. It's very difficult for somebody to have a change in inclination when they've been inclined to something their whole life. It's a, pr it's a process. But the process will not work supernaturally unless you give yourself to God's word naturally. That's why the psalmist means when he says, I have stored up your word in my heart that a, I may not sin against you. So if you have a besetting sin that you're dealing with, okay, something that you can't, you, you're having a hard time getting your arms around, what this passage says is, the more you stay in tune with God's word and God's will and you remember it and you live it, the more victory you will get over the thing that holds you. The amount of our victory is tied to the amount of words that are stored in our heart. So when I say, look at the cross, you're in a sin, and I say, look at Jesus. It's not a looking that says, whew, thank God, because every Friday morning I do cocaine and get high. Thank God for Jesus. It's, it's, that's not the way you look at him. You look at him and 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 you ask and you ask and you ask and you battle and you say, I don't, I don't, I don't. And he is faithful in those moments to grant you a degree of victory. A degree, a degree, a degree, a degree of victory. In other words, Grace is something that God does to us externally, but it's also a power that he works in us internally. 
And so God's grace is not opposed to our action. I think a lot of people think that it is. That we can just go and we can just look and that it just, it'll, it'll be fine. So we've got affliction, it leads to education, it leads to transformation, and then lastly, it leads to exaltation. So Psalm 119 begins with, Blessed are those whose way is blameless. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who do no wrong but walk in his ways. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I would not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. See how the psalmist says, if I had my eyes fixed on your commandments, they'd change me. I wouldn't be put to shame. I'd be walking in your ways. Your word works. But once the affliction and the education and the transformation occurs, look what's on the back end of it. Exaltation, that's the fourth. Affliction, education, transformation, exaltation. Verse 7, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. So, exaltation follows education and transformation. And that's why God works it out this way. So that when you get the other through the other side of it, and you've lived in the power of God's grace and given yourself to his word and you've stored them up in your heart. It's not looking at them in a mirror and be like, I do whatever I want to do. When God's word is what you want to do, you say, this is all God. He's changed me. I am different. I'm changed. And what makes this possible? And the only thing that makes this possible is grace. Grace in which we stand and grace in which we've received from the person of Jesus Christ. And I, and I want to end with this. I want to end with what Jesus did for us. Romans 5, 1 through 6. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance, character, character, hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's Romans 5, 1 through 6. Remember the passage I read early in Romans 6 that says, don't, give, don't present your instruments as slaves to sin, but present yourselves and your members as slaves to God through righteousness, for you were no longer under law, but under grace. You remember that? Romans 6, 12 through 14. Before Paul tells us anything about giving ourselves to God and the power of grace, he tells us this. Christ died for the ungodly. Why does he do it in that order? Why does he say, at the right time, while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly? And then, later on, a whole other chapter, present yourselves as slaves to God and your members as slaves to righteousness, for you're no longer under law but under grace. Here's why. The only sin that you can defeat by the power of the Holy Spirit is one that has been forgiven by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's why. You can only defeat a sin that is forgiven. If the opposite were true, Christ died for no purpose. If you could defeat your sin before it was forgiven, you don't need Christ to die for you. Christ died for the ungodly. The ungodly that lived under the power of law. And sin, so that now we live under the power of righteousness and grace. Everything that I said about looking and storing up and treasuring and God's work, word working in us supernaturally through like natural means of Bible reading is a reality because Christ died for the ungodly. You're not forgiven of your sin once you defeat it. You're forgiven of your sin, so you can defeat it. That's the gospel. So many Christians live their life on the hamster wheel of salvation 
wondering or thinking that only when their sin is defeated that they will receive God's forgiveness. Unaware that their reception of God's forgiveness is instrumental in defeating their sin. You can't defeat a sin that's not forgiven. It's forgiveness and then victory. And so as we read our Bibles and we give ourselves to God's word and we ask that he would help us break the chains that hold us, we do so with a view to the cross that says, you are forgiven, now be free. And that's my ending exhortation. You are forgiven. If you're a Christian, now be free. And if you're not, receive forgiveness. While we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ didn't die for anyone at their best. He died for everyone while they were at their worst. And he comes to you right there in a place where you don't think anybody else should come. And he says, you're forgiven. Take my hand. Let's walk in freedom. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have a great name. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus Christ. When it is uttered, we will see every knee bow in heaven and under heaven and on the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the name we come to you in today. And we ask you that you would give, help us to be people that give ourselves to your word wholeheartedly with full assurance of faith. And that you would actually work in us, Lord, as we read your word and meditate on it, the very thing that you demand from us. I pray that we would not be passive lookers of, onlookers of your word and leave and do what we really want to do with no thought to what your word says. But you would help us to persevere in our gazing at Jesus Christ. And that you would help us to walk by faith in what you in, in the things in which you've told us to walk. Help us to believe your promises, Lord. If there are those who have not been saved, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open their eyes. We know you tell us in your word that God calls us to be born again through the living and abiding word. And I pray that that would happen today. That as people would hear this word about how Christ died for every one of their sins, was buried and was raised for their proof of complete forgiveness, for their justification, that they would forsake hope in the things that don't satisfy and the things that don't save. It would cling to you, our only hope, our gracious Redeemer, our soon coming King, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose blessed name we pray. Amen.